Hello there, I'm Toby Haydock, and one day we'll know all the mysteries of the skies. Welcome to Too Much Information, which aims to tell you the who, what and when of Doctor Who. A television programme about improvising your way out of an apocalypse with things that don't look too expensive. Whether you're discovering the episodes for the very first time, or you know your Charmat from your Astrakhan hat, then you're extremely welcome on this odyssey behind the scenes, which aims to go through the series one episode at a time. In this edition, we're looking at an episode which gets clobbered by the unavailability of a key player very late in the day, and has to be hastily rewritten, and which also fulfills Sidney Newman's educational ambitions for the series. So join me, Toby Haydock, as I give you the who, what and when of Doctor Who, The Singing Sands, or Storm in a Studio Decap. First broadcast, 29th of February, 1964, at 5.15pm. It starred William Hartnell as Doctor Who, William Russell as Ian Chesterton, Jacqueline Hill as Barbara Wright, and Carol Ann Ford as Susan Foreman, with Mark Eden as Marco Polo, and Darren Nesbitt as Tigana. It was written by John Luca Rotti, produced by Verity Lambert, and directed by Wallace Hussain. It was watched by 9.4 million people and had an audience appreciation of 62. The Doctor is skulking in the TARDIS, angry with Marco but the rest of the travellers engage with the party, which is making progress across the Gobi Desert. Ian and Marco play chess, whilst Susan and Ping Cho have become great friends, but get caught out in a sandstorm, rescued by Tagana, who has been abroad for his own ends. The warlord slashes the water gourds containing valuable hydration for the long, hot trek across the sand. When the lack of water is discovered, it is decided that one of their party should go on a rescue mission to a nearby oasis. But the person they choose is Tigana. The When 27th of September 1963 the aim is for Luca Rotti's scripts for Marco Polo to arrive in a producible state at the BBC on the 7th or 8th of October in order to be ready for rehearsals. The Singing Sands has a title, not something episodes 5, 6 and 7 can boast at this stage. 10th of September. Name or not, The Singing Sands, like the rest of Marco Polo, has got lost in the desert as the promised episodes have still not arrived at the BBC. They get there eventually though, and the production is brought time thanks to the necessary insertion of the story The Edge of Destruction into the schedule. See last episode. 13th of January 1964. It's the first day of filming for Marco Polo. Captured today is an establishing model shot of the tent in the desert for the singing sands and the moment that the water cascades from the sabotaged gourds. Although there will be water in the studio during the final Oasis sequence, minimising liquid in the electronic studio is always helpful, hence getting this key moment of water on the floor locked off before recording at Lime Grove. 14th of January. The sequences featuring the caravan and two extras, which will be utilised in montage footage underneath the map sequences, are filmed today. For the Singing Sands, this involves the caravan being pulled with difficulty through the hot desert, with one of the extras seen physically pushing one of the wheels on his knees. 16th of January. The only filmed sequence unique to episode 2 and featuring a principal character is filmed today, with Darren Nesbitt as Tigana appearing over the brow of the sand dune in the nighttime storm sequence, shot from below, first with a face covering and then without it or removing it, some of this in close-up. These two shots, the first is three seconds and the second, around twelve, are silent and played into the action during the sandstorm sequences, with the sand effects laid on top, 
some of which are possibly achieved through electrical interference from the cameras and some by overlay of swirling sand footage. The second of the two shots of Tigana features a zoom in onto the villain's face. 3rd of February. Rehearsals begin for Marco Polo at the Drill Hall, 239 Uxbridge Road. Unfortunately, William Hartnell is unwell and doesn't come to work, and so the team need to decide what to do. 4th of February. David Whittaker writes to Hartnell at his home. Dear Bill, he writes, so sorry you aren't feeling so well, but take it easy and get better soon. Everything here is under control, and please don't worry about a thing. By under control, he means swift rewrites, as rehearsals continue without Hartnell. Although between the star and the team, it is decided he will still appear in the episode, only with minimal input. 5th of February. Rehearsals continue without Hartnell and with a script. The rewriting has removed his participation in all but one scene, which means he will only have a grand total of two lines in the finished episode. Although it's not a hugely Doctor Heavy instalment anyway, there are still a number of scenes he was planned to be in which now will have to be reworked. Fortunately, Polo's opening monologue, recorded much earlier, talks of the Doctor being angry with and insulting our narrator, and so his absence, with the help of a bit of rewriting in the non-pre-film scenes, seems like withdrawal in a huff. 7th of February. Hartnell joins the cast and crew for the recording of the episode. He is only required to deliver a couple of lines and to be exhausted and dehydrated, so even if he's still not 100%, his performance will have a certain authenticity about it. The opening scene is a remount of last week's closing moment, but with an extra, possibly John Lee or Arnold Lee, standing in for Leslie Bates as Man at Lop, who doesn't need to speak nor be paid an actor's fee in this instalment. Camera rehearsal begins at 10.30am, with recording taking place between 8.30pm and 9.45pm at Studio D, Lime Grove. 29th of February. The Singing Sands is broadcast. To this day, it remains the only Doctor Who episode in the history of the show to be broadcast on the 29th of February. It is also, at 26 minutes and 34 seconds, the longest-running episode up until this point, beating the ordeal by 20 seconds. It will remain the longest-running episode until the final instalment of Planet of Giants, which is, in truth, two episodes stuck together. The audience of 9.4 million and the chart placing of 33 are identical to those for last week. It has slipped in the audience appreciation stakes, though. At 62, it has lost a point since the roof of the world. 1st of March. Distinguished TV critic Philip Purser of the Sunday Telegraph has some things to say about Marco Polo. Whatever troubles may assail the rest of the BBC's drama department, the serials thrive. Doctor Who on Saturdays has also gone period, with a plunge into the days of Marco Polo, here impersonated with sartorial dash by Mark Eden. The serial department has rediscovered a classic formula in the exploits of the time machine and its motley crew. The absent-minded professor with his sponge bag trousers, the hero schoolmaster, the brazen flirtation with epic themes, all could have come from the modern boy somewhere around 1935. Only the begined Susan is a purely contemporary figure. The hero's girl, Barbara, I'm afraid, will have been written off by now as a persistent drip. Which section of the audience is expected to identify with her, I wonder? William Hartnell has extraordinarily metamorphosed his former Sergeant Major persona to become the mysterious Doctor Who. The what? <laughs> Hypothesis alert. These podcasts try to avoid speculation, but this one is a special case. Because the opening moments of The Singing Sands might just be the very first bit of Doctor Who that we don't have in any form today. On all current audio copies, Darren Nesbitt's delivery of the speech, bespoke vocal patterning, line changes and all, is identical, too identical to be true, to last week's cliffhanger. But we know that the cliffhanger was restaged and so respoken in this week's reprise. 
the cliffhanger wasn't fed in from a film recording of last week's action. It will be marginally different, which suggests that this week's restaging, or less likely last week's cliffhanger, has been lost if both versions of this piece of action are the same in all current releases at the end of the roof of the world and the beginning of the singing sands. Now, there's a slim chance that the restaging just hasn't made it into these widely distributed versions of the episode in sound form. As this is probably only the second episode ever to be recorded off air by David Holman, his habit of stopping at the beginning of the closing credits of one episode and restarting after the reprise the following week in order to save tape may not have been settled upon, but we've not had access to the raw materials and Mark Ayres is a busy man. Worth a ponder though, did he let any part of the reprise sneak in and does somewhere the restaged version, which it doesn't sound like we can hear at the moment, exist anywhere at all? There are currently two soundtrack recordings of The Singing Sands. Holman's was used on the soundtrack CD release of Marco Polo, but James Russell had one too. The Russell tapes vary in quality and were copies of recordings made by John de Rivas, who has only recently been located and whose tapes have not yet been properly catalogued. So there haven't been comparisons to check the issues surrounding this admittedly arcane conjecture. Well. We don't know, and cataloguing these soundtracks is an ongoing project. So in the future, it's possible that there may be four or five seconds of Doctor Who dialogue that will be new to us. For this episode, set largely in the desert, more than half of Lime Grove Studio D is given over to its sandy environs. There is a cart on this set too, with the whole area surrounded by a large cyclorama. To help with perspective, sand dunes are created out of hessian sacks covering rostra and sprinkled with sawdust. The studio floor is painted to represent sand. A small individual section is used to represent the dune for the sandstorm scenes. There's a black cyclorama used here as it is only seen at night. The oasis set at the end of the episode is also small. Both of these sets are shot by just one camera when it comes to the recording. Camera 1 on a flexible mole crane with plenty of vertical movement for the dune and camera 3 for the oasis. Wallace Hussein also has the luxury of a low mounted creeper camera as camera 4, which he generally uses in the scenes in Ping Cho's section of the tent, taking advantage of its having a ceiling. The episode's title caption and writer's credit are superimposed on the map sequence after the reenacted cliffhanger from last week. As mentioned last time, John Lucarotti's original intention was that the narration be done by the regulars. In his original script for The Singing Sands, the opening monologue comes from The Doctor, which covers much of the same information as imparted by Polo in his opening diary entry here, but also makes note of the fact that it is too hot to travel at a decent speed between mid-morning and mid-afternoon. Polo's second entry was originally Barbara's, and so, without his bringing up of his gratitude to Tigana for saving the young women from the sandstorm, and his final one was written for Ian, which, although very similar, has slightly less of a desperate tone to its conclusion than it does in the finished piece. Scene three, between Barbara and Susan outside, which makes use of a photo caption to represent the starry sky, was originally to be a scene between the Doctor and his granddaughter within the main tent. It went like this. We'll get Tardis, Grandfather. I know we will. At Kubla Khan's court when it's too late. No, long before that. I bet you anything you like that MP will give it back. You have more faith in the rogue than I have. Oh, Grandfather, he's an honest man. Honest men don't steal. I know he hadn't any right to take the ship, but at least he tried to explain why he did it. As a gift for Kubla Khan, so that he'll let Polo go home. What about us? How are we supposed to go? Home. He doesn't know we're from another time. He thinks we're from some distant country. Which can be reached by boat from Venice, the fool. Even if we told him the truth, he'd never believe us. You know, Grandfather, you could try being civil to him. Why should I? Because rudeness isn't helping us. If you were polite, it might do some good. I doubt it. 
Oh, you're so obstinate. You won't even try, will you? Susan. Try, Grandfather. We'll spend at least a month crossing this desert. Are you going to be a bad-tempered old bear all the time? Come here, Susan. I'm sorry, Grandfather. We should be up there. Another dimension. Another time. Another galaxy. Very well. I'll try. Now, off to bed. It's late. And we have an early start in the morning. Yes, Grandfather. Good night. I still think he's a fool. The replacement scene, with Susan and Barbara, has been added to the script, initially in David Whittaker's handwriting, so he can comfortably be nominated the writer of it, especially as Lucarotti is so tricky to get hold of, living abroad on a boat. In the new scene as written, Susan was to address the sky directly, but this is changed come recording. When Susan interrupts Marco and Ian playing chess, it was Ian who was to tell her that Ping Cho has gone to bed, which Marco then confirms. Instead of the repetition, Ian says shh as intended, and then the rest of his line is given to Marco, and Marco's repetitious line is then cut. The end of the chess scene, after Barbara has entered, has been cut. She was to head for bed after Tigana has asked Marco Polo if he can save his king, telling the Venetian that... I hope you get your king out of trouble, Polo. To which he was to reply, uh, Thank you, Miss Wright. I shall do my best. Susan's extra bit of slang, explaining to Ping Cho that thinking the night view is crazy means that she digs it, is an additional line. There's no digging in the camera script. Marco's line in the following scene about the horses being restless is also a late addition. In the following scene, as Susan and Ping Cho go after Tigana, Ping Cho originally had a line saying that they must hurry or that they will lose him, but this is gone come recording. When Susan returns to her tent, her line asking whether the doctor has been worried is an elaboration of the script, and then Marco takes what was to be the second half of Ian's line, once again. The doctor was also to take part in the sandstorm scenes, but here his lines are either cut or given to Barbara. There was also to be an exchange between the Doctor, Ian and Barbara, which has been totally cut. In it, the Doctor confesses to Ian that he has a yearning to smoke a pipe, which results in the schoolteacher referring back to the one that was lost in the second episode. The Doctor claims to have other pipes in the ship, and then, as they discuss whether Marco will allow him access to it, claims that he will need three days to effect the necessary repairs to the TARDIS. On two occasions in the rehearsal scripts, the Doctor is referred to as Doctor Who in the dialogue. In the scene in which Marco instructs everyone how to search for the Oasis, he tells them all to go in a different direction. Doctor Who to the west, and I shall take the north. In the excised exchange mentioned just now, Ian says, If Doctor Who were caught, Marco would most certainly confiscate the key. The Doctor doesn't actually appear in the episode until over 22 minutes in and then he's dishevelled and knackered, which is helpful when your leading man has been ill. With set designer Barry Newbury ingeniously using as much studio space as possible, experienced lighting man John Triese needs all the skill at his disposal to make the sets work, including creating moonlight for the nighttime scenes set during the sandstorm and lighting the cyclorama of the desert set so that it looks like dunes receding into the distance and not as it is, a great big curtain not very far away from the cast and props. Triese and Newbury, however, are not especially simpatico, and this leads to a fractious working relationship. Triez finds the roofed tent set, in particular, very hard to light properly. The chess match between Ian and Polo contains some more of the programme's educational remit, with Tigana explaining the origin of the phrase checkmate, Sharmat, the king is dead. The chess match also serves as a metaphor for the manoeuvring of the Mongol warlord and our heroes. Marco's chess set is from Hormuz, which in real life was crossed through in the early part of his journey through Persia in 1271-1272. According to the camera script, the sandstorm is achieved by playing in, from Telesini, sandstorm footage created in the film studio and overlaid into the studio video picture. 
Boris Hussein later claimed that the sandstorm is, at least in part, and unusually, created using electrical interference played into the picture rather than the more usual wind machine and flying sawdust combination. One of the crew has suggested this less messy method to Hussein, and he is delighted, achieving the effect as live and so cutting down on pre-filming necessities. However, there is a wind machine present in the studio on the day to ruffle the cast's clothes and hair, and Xenia Merton gets an eyeful of sand when shooting the sequence during the as-live performance and has to be helped by Ford, with the pair carrying on regardless. So at least some of this sequence is achieved the normal way. It could be that the electrical interference method is just used on the film sequences, i.e. Tigana on the dune, with the more traditional sawdust and wind in the electronic studio. The telesnaps are inconclusive. If anyone would care to find the episode so we can know for certain, then please do. There are four recording breaks, the maximum allowed really, in this technically complex episode. The first comes after Susan and Ping Cho follow Tigana, which enables all of the cameras to reposition. The second comes after Tigana has looked at the poison file and before the second map telecine sequence. This also allows for a repositioning of cameras. The third comes after the telecine sequences of the water flowing from the gourds, which leads to a fade to black, allowing for adverts here for foreign broadcasters, and before the scene outside the tent discussing the ramifications of this. The final break comes after Marco and Tigana have their difference of opinion, and Marco determines that they shall journey north together. This allows everyone to change costume, or at least loosen them up a bit to suggest heat and exhaustion. It's pretty well known that the end of episode caption here is a mistake. It says, next episode, the cave of 500 eyes, when it's actually just going to be called next week, 500 eyes. However, elsewhere in the camera script, there is a request for the caption to say, next episode, the Wall of Lies, which is not only the incorrect title, it's not THE, it's just called Wall of Lies, it's the incorrect episode, as Wall of Lies is in fact due the week after next. So, you know, could have been worse. The Who. Xenia Merton. Xenia Merton, playing Ping Cho in Marco Polo, was born in Borneo, the youngest daughter of Burmese-born Minnie Merton and half-English, half-French merchant husband Cecil. Xenia had a peripatetic upbringing which took her from Borneo to England via Singapore and Portugal where she began her education. A shy and artistic youngster, she was sent to the Arts Educational School in Hertfordshire after it was decided that this would benefit her more than a traditional English boarding school. The establishment was also able to secure professional bookings for its pupils, and so she made her debut as a dancer in the Royal Festival Ballet's Christmas production of The Nutcracker, 1957, playing a rat. She repeated this engagement the following year, this time promoted to playing a kitchen maid as well. Her first screen role was an early brush with science fiction, playing a Venusian in the Children's Film Foundation's Masters of Venus, 1962. Having swelled the ranks playing a fairy in A Midsummer Night's Dream at Regent's Park Open Air Theatre and various animals in Toad of Toad Hall at the Comedy Theatre, 1962, directed by David William, she got her big television break when a school friend had informed her that a director she had met was looking for a Chinese girl for a television engagement. Xenia was at the time having a second go at Toad of Toad Hall for Christmas 1963 and spent her first week's wages to buy an outfit she thought suitable for a Chinese girl and, as requested, having phoned him, visited the director, Waris Hussain, at home on a Saturday when she had no rehearsal obligations. She was successful and so Ping Cho became her first television part. Ultra keen, she turned up already knowing her lines which resulted in her co-star Mark Eden making up a joshing rhyme in her honour. Xenia Merton is always certain to know her lines. Because she swats, she has frequent spots, which she maintains her broken veins. Xenia was given invaluable advice by the series' lead, William Hartnell. The experienced old trooper told the television debutante that, as they were shooting as live, if she wanted the scene cut for any reason, 
that she should say the F word, because then the director would have no choice. She never put that advice to the test. She soon appeared in feature films as well, although unlike television, her parts weren't initially much to write home about. Nevertheless, she turns up in the Beatles film Help in 1965, and better for her was 1969's The Chairman, aka the most dangerous man in the world, sharing scenes with her childhood idol, Gregory Peck. The pair got on well, and he made her feel at ease during their nerve-wracking bedroom scene. She was touched when, after Peck's death, she was given a handwritten note that he had sent to director Robert Parrish, recommending her for a role, something she had hitherto been unaware of. The film never happened, but had it, this recommendation from Peck would have helped for sure. Xenia is perfect for the part. She is very, very good. Wife-like, smart, humorous in a whimsical sort of way, sweet and very Audrey-like. I liked her enormously. Don't think you could do better. She was also in The Adventurers, 1970, directed by Lewis Gilbert, uncredited for her role as the victim of a violent sexual assault, but better for her was Wenn du bei mir bist, 1970, in which she was second billed after the star popular German singer Roy Black, playing a hunky air steward who fell in love with her princess. Her ethnicity meant that in television at the time, she would be considered right casting in what would be considered general foreigner parts. Half Burmese could be Pakistani, say, no problem. She played a gypsy in the 30-minute theatre Trespassers, and when co-star Norman Eshley turned up using a Devonian accent, she discovered, to her horror, that she'd be having to adopt one too. But she was versatile and mucked in and did it. And this turned out to be great preparation for the role of Christina the Maid in controversial but high-end playwright Dennis Potter's Casanova, 1971, a prominent role that required on-screen nudity, which meant her topless appearance ensured that Casanova incurred the wrath of Mary Whitehouse and was much talked about and daring for the time. She also played a character called Xenia in an episode of Jason King called Xenia, but the abundance of Xenias did nothing to make the show's star, Peter Wingard, any less tricky in Xenia's eyes. She worked again with Warris Hussain on the film version of The Six Wives of Henry VIII in 1972, sharing scenes with the film's star, Keith Michelle, but all of her moments ended up on the cutting room floor. She guaranteed her place in the annals of TV science fiction history as one of the regular cast of the Jerry Anderson sci-fi series Space 1999, which ran from 1975 to 1977, but has retained a cult following ever since. At audition, the character she was up for was called Sandra Sabatini, but she decided not to do an Italian accent, too musical, she thought, and instead adopted more clipped tones, which she called her Foreign Mark I. It worked, and the producers had looked at a lot of actresses for the role, and so she became the renamed Sandra Benesch, Data analyst, although in later episodes she adopts the single moniker San. Set on the moon, propelled through space due to a thermonuclear explosion, Space 1999 was filmed at Pinewood Studios and starred American imports Martin Landau and Barbara Bain. Merton was one of only two of the show's regular supporting cast to be brought back for the second season, and she ultimately appeared in 37 of the show's 48 episodes. She actually left the series after an inauspicious start to series two without a regular contract and the loss of many of her co-stars at the instigation of new producer Fred Freiberger. She was lured back, however, with the promise that the character would play a more prominent role in later episodes. It wasn't a promise that was fulfilled particularly well and the second series was not an especially satisfying experience for her. But she did return to the role in the short film monologue Message from Moonbase Alpha, which was a coda to the series made for fans in 1999, written by Johnny Byrne, especially to coincide with the actual date of the series, in which she gives an emotional performance as Sandra, bidding farewell and being the last person to leave the base. Merton was also one of the terrorists in Hijack to Mogadishu, 1980, based on the real-life 1977 militant attack on a Lufthansa plane, part of the series Escape and produced by season one Doctor Who director Frank Cox, who'd previously used Xenia on The Troubleshooters. 
She was cast as the lead female role, Sylvia, in the movie Privates on Parade, but unable to do it after a surprise diagnosis with diabetes. But her television career prospered, and she played Miss Ho in the 1981 adaptation of Malcolm Bradbury's The History Man, starring Anthony Scher. Her other television work consisted of guest spots in popular fare over the years, Jason King, 1972, Return of the Saint, 1978, Bergerac, 1983, Peak Practice, 1998, Wire in the Blood, 2008, and Law and Order UK, 2009. In later years, she was often cast as doctors and receptionists, playing the former in Family Affairs, 2000, The Bill, 2001, Doctors, 2001, Judged on Deed, 2006, and Coronation Street, 2008, and the latter in Time Traveller, 1997, and one of each in both EastEnders, 1998 and 2002 3, and Casualty, 1986, 1991, 92. And she, of course, returned to the Doctor Who universe in The Sarah Jane Adventures, 2009, playing the registrar at the wedding of Sarah Jane Smith, and so reunited with the Doctor, although he was now played by David Tennant, not William Hartnell, 45 years after her appearance in Marco Polo. Her final TV role also had a Doctor Who connection. She appeared in the two-part Wizards vs. Aliens story The Cave of Menlag To, overseen, of course, by Russell T. Davis in 2013. Latterly, she moved from London to Norwich, and so was less available for work. And then came the terrible news that she had terminal cancer. Her agent, Barry Langford, recalls that she dealt with the diagnosis in her customarily straightforward way. She put her affairs in order, arranged and paid for her funeral, and never once complained or said, why me? She was, though, thrilled, according to Barry, to be asked to read the BBC audiobook of Marco Polo. By now, seriously ill, she was unsure if she would have the strength to do it. But with typical determination, and because she considered the original production to have been her big break, and that starting and ending her career with the same project would lend it a pleasing symmetry, she gathered her strength and she saw it through. The finished result, recorded in just two days at a studio near her home, was released posthumously. Xenia Merton died on the 14th of September 2018 at the age of 72. And so ends another episode of Doctor Who. A unique one in a couple of respects. The only episode to be broadcast on February the 29th and the only one in which the Doctor is absent but not. Other 60s stories bear the loss of a regular fairly well, but here, just 15 episodes in, the absence of the lead due to illness is covered by minimising his input via some quick rewrites that actually slot in fairly seamlessly, and indeed tie in well with what is required of the Doctor next week. Invention, thinking on your feet, coming up with something ingenious to cover up for an impracticality. Doctor Who, in a nutshell. And so Hartnell is in the episode, but in a fashion that minimises his involvement in rehearsals. The fact that this original quartet of characters is such an ensemble is only emphasised when the ostensible lead is unavailable and the others carry the episode well. Ian playing chess, both literally and metaphorically with Polo, Susan bonding with Ping Cho and getting into trouble, and Barbara acting as the voice of reassurance to her young friend whilst pricking Polo's conscience when she goes missing. After all, none of them would be in danger if Polo had not taken their property, which is the central dramatic conceit of the story. The good guy is causing our heroes as much trouble as the bad guy. Once again, the very environment is as much a threat as anything else. The singing sands are as full of alien menace and strangeness as anything encountered extraterrestrially. How successful these sequences would have been depends on something we cannot fully ascertain whether Hussein relied on electronical interference or inlay to convey the flying sand particles. As mentioned, accounts and paperwork are conflicted on this, but the sound is certainly disturbing and fulfils the script's clever attempts to make the natural phenomenon seem eerie and disturbing. In a period of the show where Doctor Who is as strange as it is terrifying, and in the early 60s it's arguable that the programme is as strange as it ever gets, the idea that voices echo and reverberate, morphing into haunting, disturbing, even 
tempting hollering show John Lucarotti cleverly integrating a science fact into the science fiction storytelling, even in an historical adventure. It also shows that not all the perils we encounter on this journey to Cathay come in human form and makes for a haunting, disconcerting sequence that also provides some physical peril for our likeable pair of girl adventurers, divided by centuries and yet united by friendship. And we get more manoeuvring from Tigana, a very interesting, engaging baddie with a relationship with our eponymous hero that bubbles and buffets. He's no Iago. He doesn't quite hide his villainy in the way Shakespeare's arch manipulator does, but that is almost cleverer. He almost taunts Marco and doesn't hide his selfishness in regard to the water ration. But having spent last week's cliffhanger obtaining poison, he now, oddly, decides not to use it, instead slashing the water gourds to let the precious hydration run out. We can excuse that perhaps as sadism, and the only poison he issues is verbal pouring words into Marco's ear to spread suspicion and dissent. And in that way, he is like Shakespeare's villain. But this is chess, not Othello. And so he gives us some educational content that would please show creator Sidney Newman. Shamat, we are told, is the word that inspires the cry of checkmate. And Shamat means the king is dead. Oh, and... Here's water, Marco Polo. Come for it. Doctor Who, The Singing Sands, featured Xenia Merton as Ping Cho. The title music was by Ron Grainer at the BBC Radiophonic Workshop. The incidental music by Tristram Carey. The story editor was David Whittaker. The designer, Barry Newbury. And the associate producer, was Mervyn Pinfield. Coming next, you had to make your own entertainment in those days, and so Ping Cho puts on a show whilst Barbara is kidnapped and the Doctor finds an oasis in the TARDIS. That's next time on Doctor Who, Too Much Information. Next episode, 500 Eyes, or condensation, that's what you need. Too Much Information, The Singing Sands, was written and presented by me, Toby Hado, with additional voices provided by Chrissy Bone and Shirley Houston. With thanks to Richard Atkinson, Mark Ayres, Richard Bignall, David Brunt, Peter Crocker, Simon Gerrier, Graham Kibble-White, Barry Langford, Charles Norton and Boris Hussain. The series consultant is Richard Bignall, and the music has been specially composed by Wayne Shepherd. There is a supplemental podcast, one per story as opposed to per episode, far too much information. That is for now exclusive to patrons who also qualify for bonus material, early releases and other exclusives, as well as pictures of my dog. Patrons are also nearly six months ahead with my Happy Times and Places podcast. So if you want to hear esteemed science fiction journalist Jeremy Bentham tell you what it was like watching Marco Polo at the time, or comedian Catherine Mather getting potty-mouthed about the girl in the fireplace, then nip over to patreon.com Toby Haydock. References A word about Philip Purser quoted for the first time in Too Much Information, this edition, calling Barbara a drip. Despite this lapse in his judgment, he was one of the foremost TV critics of the time, and unlike many of the modern iteration of that breed, he genuinely understood the medium and knew and appreciated its creatives. His death at the age of 96 was announced as I was preparing this episode, and although he didn't directly help with this podcast, he did kindly share some of his materials and opinions with me when we corresponded some years ago. What a pleasure it was to be in his orbit. Most of the information herein, as with every too much information, comes from going back to source and sifting through the original scripts and paperwork, which have been shared from various sources. You know who you are, and thank you. Patrick Mulkern wrote three of the best research articles about a particular Doctor Who story, in this case Marco Polo, 
by going into detail and poring over paperwork with its director, Waris Hussain, over three issues in Doctor Who magazine from number 483 in 2015. I have also consulted various reference works for this podcast, Doctor Who, A Complete History, edited by John Ainsworth and Mark Wright, with contributions from Jonathan Morris, Alistair McGowan and Richard Atkinson, and much of it based, of course, on those fantastic archives features by Andrew Pixley. Richard Bignall's Nothing at the End of the Lane is one of the best things ever, and he's great for this period of the show and for replying to stupid emails in the middle of the night. Thanks, Richard. How Stammers and Walkers, The Sixties and The First Doctor Handbook are both excellent and uncovered much of what we know now and take for granted. Ditto J. Jeremy Bentham's Doctor Who, The Early Years. The TARDIS wiki page and Shannon Patrick Sullivan's Complete History of Time Travel have also been very valuable for quick, handy reference. And I subscribe to the British Newspaper Archive, Ancestry.com and Newspapers.com, which are vital resources, but also places where it is very easy to get lost for several days, so proceed with caution. I walk in the shadows of giants, albeit giants who could have left those two big early years production files in chronological order to make it a heck of a lot easier for the rest of us, but didn't. Blowing giants with their big gianty fingers. I would also like to thank the many patrons who make these podcasts possible and keep them ad-free. And they include Ruben Herfendahl, Stephen Moffat, Tim Arding, Chris Arkell, David. I think David wants to remain anonymous, but if you're not hearing your surname, David, you must give it to me. I know there are lots of Davids, but the David who's... you know what I mean. Nigel Brumley, Jenny at Bluebox99, Peter Cook, Richard Chalk. Richard Chalk has just got married. Congratulations to Richard. Peter Crocker, Rob Dawson, John Deere, Chris Dunford Kelk, Paul Dunn, Jason Gorman, Siobhan Galichon, Chris Hyam, Ian Key, Joe Llewellyn, Ian K. McLachlan, Gavin McLean, Rick Moran, Nathan Martin, Graham Knott, Adam Parker, Barry Platt, Risto Matti Sarillo, Frank Shales, David Trainier, Russell McPhillip, Stuart Mitchell, Nathan Moore, Jonathan Molyneux, Kevin Murdoch, Matthew Newton, Graham Knott, Dave Owen, Melvin Pena, Keith Pirry, Jonathan Potter, Kevin Parker, Scott Pride, Dylan Reese, John Rivers, Mark Sandon, Jim Sangster, Matt Sawyer, Neil Tate, Nick Temple, Sabrina Tirabassi, Apollo C. Vermouth, Gary Wales, Adam Westwood, Rich Wiggins, Michael Williams, Andrew Willis, Andrew Wilson, Sidney Wilson, and Stephen White. If you would like to become a patron, one of the bonuses that you get is to have your name read out on the end credits. Patrons pay from as little as £3 per month to support these podcasts and ensure that they retain ad-free so you don't have me doing a badly acted advert for a product I don't really like but have to pretend that I bought independently and then by coincidence advertise for as though I really, really love it. Uh, so none of that. Uh, but that's uh, that's made, I would not say it's made possible by patrons, but it's justified uh, by patrons uh, by uh, subscribing for £3 a month or more. You get a few extra things if you go up the tiers, but not many. Everything's available really at entry level because I don't like withholding things. As I say, there's a few little trinkets here and there, but most things available at £3 per month and you can get 10% off that if you subscribe for a year in advance. The stuff that you get includes bonus releases, exclusive material, your very own podcast just for you, too much information, uh, monthly Ask Me Anythings and all sorts of other bits and bobs, including the ridiculously popular photographs of my dog Bernard. Uh, if you cannot submit to any kind of monthly commitment, and I totally understand that in these terrible financial times in which we find ourselves. So, as I say, I'm very grateful to, to, to anybody who is a patron. Goodness me. But you can go to ko-fi.com forward slash Toby Haydock. And I don't know if you have a good week or you're feeling particularly flush or I do a podcast that you think is above and beyond the call of sanity. You can uh, you can you can buy me a coffee that costs whatever you want a coffee to cost. Uh, but you don't, unfortunately, they get the bonus materials or anything. That's just a, it's just a chance to you to throw a few pennies in my hat as you walk past me busking facts in the London underground of cyberspace. That ran away with me a little bit. Um, but what costs you nothing? Because I understand that times are tough and I'm just grateful that there are people out there listening to these. 
is uh, going to your provider of podcasts, iTunes, Podbean, Spotify, wherever you can go and give these five stars. And that does really help. And especially at the moment in Australia, where I've taken a bit of a dent. Um, <laughs> so could do with upping my algorithm. My, my algorithms could do with some Antipodean tweeting. Someone's taken again me. Uh, it might just fair buff he might just think i'm awful um but uh, it's, it's it's nicer for me isn't it if i if i decide that he's awful but uh he's perfectly entitled to his opinion i just wish he hadn't expressed it in algorithmic form so uh, if you could redress the balance um uh but uh, yes in australia if you if you get these in australia on itunes yeah go and put something nice um but anywhere that really helps to be perfectly honest with you and uh uh, it, as I say, costs you nothing but your time. I'm grateful for it, though. And I'm also a stand-up comedian. I'm on Twitter at Toby Haydoke. These podcasts are at Haydoke Podcasts. And I also run a comedy club called Excess Malarkey at Excess Malarkey, which is uh, on in Manchester every Tuesday at 8pm. We have a Twitch channel too, twitch.tv forward slash Excess Malarkey. I don't know if we're going to be able to carry on with the the uh, the internet shows on Twitch, uh, but we've got an archive of material there, and I'm looking into what to do there. So so maybe check it if you've got an idle moment. There's certainly loads of comedy up there right now, but uh, going forward, uh, I'm going to see what I'm going to do with that. Um, I'll probably do something. Um, oh, that made me feel very needy, didn't it? The old uh, Australia thing, but um, I don't know. If you don't like something, just don't put anything. <laughs> I don't. I don't waste my time going around going, I don't like that. Um, uh, anyway, 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 anyway. Uh, it's what happens. It's what happens. Right. Um, so, good. Marco Polo. That's interesting about the soundtrack, isn't it? It's a very good story, too. It's a very good story. I do hope it turns up. Um, uh, I did hear a story that I've never had confirmed where... Um, Somebody from a foreign TV station offered it to somebody at the BBC, but just got a receptionist who went, "Oh no, we've got loads of Doctor Who," and they chucked it away. But I don't know how, I don't know, I don't know whether that's true or not. Um, there's no place for that in the uh, in the actual. This isn't the actual podcast. This isn't this isn't the content. This is the, this is the post show discussion down the pub where I say things that don't have to be true. But I said so I was just talking about that to somebody today, and it really annoyed me. So I thought I'd share it with you as well because it is quite annoying but i also know how these stories get out of hand and either way we don't have it um it's a tragedy either way but um, i suppose it's a double tragedy if we could have had it and some uh, some person on admin um who, who wasn't fully conversant in the facts uh, casually <laughs> consigned our dead sea scrolls to uh, uh, a, a, a modern day inferno oh dear that is really annoying um uh yeah anyway um hope you're all very well um, Philip Purser was very good, uh, very good TV critic, and uh, yeah, he uh, he was writing back in the days of Quatermass, but he also became the Daily Mail's uh, television correspondent. His book Done Viewing uh, is quite a good insight into the art of television criticism, and he, I think, very interestingly puts you know says that that Clive James, who was very good Australian television critic, Clive James, but was also sarky and had a very good sardonic and condescending turn of phrase if he wanted to be patronising about something he thought was no good. But Purser argues that the people that followed tried to do that, but w without actually loving or knowing television in the way Clive James did, and I'm, 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 I'm not sure he doesn't have a point there. Um, that, that now I think we're, we're so keen to, 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 to enjoy cutting something down to size. I think we sometimes forget what we enjoy about the medium and how actually difficult it is to make good television or television at all in the first place. But that's boring old me trying to accentuate the positive. Um, and it, 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 it may be that I have good reason to be, to be doing that. Oh, well. <laughs>